Good afternoon. I have the honor of introducing our guest speaker for today. Dr. Vikram Mansharamani is a global trend watcher who shows people how to anticipate the future, manage risk, and spot opportunities. He first gained widespread attention with the release of his first book, Bombastology, which provided a framework for spotting bubbles before they burst. Since then, he has been a frequent commentator on issues driving disruption in the global business environment. He's a columnist for the PBS News Hour and a regular contributor to Worth magazine. His ideas and writings have also appeared in Fortune, Forbes, The New York Times, and a long list of other publications. The 500 million member LinkedIn network listed him as the number one top voice for money, finance, and economics for both 2015 and 2016, and Worth magazine profiled him as one of the 100 most powerful people in global finance. Millions of readers have enjoyed his unique multi-lens approach to connecting seemingly irrelevant dots. He also regularly advises sovereign fund management, endowments, foundations, and family offices on how to manage their allocations in the face of overwhelming uncertainty. Dr. Masharamani is currently a lecturer at the Harvard John Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, where he teaches students to use multiple perspectives in making tough decisions. Previously, he was a lecturer at Yale University. In addition to teaching, he also advises several Fortune 500 CEOs to help them navigate the radical uncertainty in today's business and regulatory environment. He has a PhD and two master's degrees from MIT and a bachelor's degree from Yale University, where he was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Vikram Manjaraman. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Uh, this is my first trip to the Philippines, and I'm honored to be uh, spending uh, this time with you. Everyone seems to be confused by today's economy and today's world. And so what I'm going to try to do over the course of roughly an hour today is to change the way you're thinking about it, to step back and to see if we can identify some of the root causes of the anxiety, the chaos, the uncertainty, the volatility, however you want to describe today's environment, that I can help you make sense of it, and more importantly, see where the future, some of these trends may be going, so we can navigate through it. That's the objective for today. So, here's a crazy proposition that I'd like to make which is all of the headlines that you read in the newspapers today or that you hear on the TV shows or that you even learn about from the different news sources can be accounted for because of four key transitions that are underway in the world today. Meaning these four transitions explain all of these headlines. My goal is to always simplify things to their root causes. If we can understand the root causes, then we can understand what's going to transpire as they shift in the future. So, four key transitions. First one, not surprising, I would suspect, to anyone in this room, China. China underwent a credit-fueled investment boom, which has since bust. They overbuilt, and they built too much. Now, they were very smart about it because at the same time, they started building a consumer society. And so they're shifting their economy from an investment-led economy towards a consumer-led economy. That shift has resulted in a little slowdown. There's a valley that they're going through. And so we've seen the exposure of a lot of overcapacity. Overcapacity of construction workers overcapacity in some sectors such as steel or some others. And so, not surprisingly, what do you do when you have too much stuff? You sell it on the markets, right? And so they've been accused of dumping, etc. So these are, I'm just giving you little tidbits of the transition. That's transition number one. I want to go quickly here. Transition number two is what's happening in technology. We're getting more output for the same or even fewer inputs. Right? So we're getting more output. So what is that doing to the aggregate supply of the world, or aggregate demand side of things? It's increasing supply. We're able to produce more with the same or fewer inputs. 
So that's more supply. I already told you China has excess supply. So excess supply was the result of transition number one. More supply is the result of transition number two. And then transition number three is what's happening in alternative energy. And not just alternative energy, but energy of all sorts. We're seeing an explosion in the availability of energy. Mainly, it was initially started because of the fracking and shale boom uh, in North America. That's spreading, by the way, globally as well. But also because of developments in alternative energy. We've seen the price of solar fall. We've gotten battery storage and power uh, storage technologies improving. Wind makes sense now in some places. And that's, again, advancements and technology. So maybe it's the same thing. But it's more supply. That is the result of this, more supply. So three of the transitions I've already talked to you about, the result is excess supply, more supply, more supply. I'm talking about this in an aggregate global sense, sort of in a macroeconomic sense. Of course, anyone can debate me and say, well, hold on a second, Vikram. Over here, we have not enough supply. OK, I understand. That's true. But I'm talking about on an aggregate global basis. Too much supply, too much supply, too much supply. And then what's happening with demand? Let's look at demographics, another key transition that's underway in the world today. The world's largest economies are aging. North America, Europe, going into Russia, into China's even going to plateau. Start. Japan is getting older quickly. And so what do people do when they shift from earning money to being living on a fixed income? They spend less. We know that. OK, that's it. Those are the four key transitions the, the world has underway right now. And so this is less demand is transition four. So if I give you these four dynamics, these four root causes to what's happening in the world today, you see that we have too much supply, 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 and then less demand. So what do we think should happen with prices? If we put these pieces together, in an aggregate sense, we have deflation, deflationary pressure, right? By the way, I have to comment for just one moment here on this picture. I'm not a student of uh, modern art, but they tell me modern art is something like this. So that's what they tell me. So this was a six-story rubber ducky that was going around the world as modern art. And then it came to the Hong Kong Harbor, and it sprung a leak. And I said, this is a perfect picture of deflation from China. <laughs> it's literally deflating. OK, anyway, so deflation is the cause of ills today. And if you think about the world I just described, too much supply of, uh, of goods and services and, and uh, output, and then not enough demand for that output. So what will countries do in this world? Imagine you are a smartphone manufacturer in Korea. And then you're competing against a smartphone manufacturer any place else, say Japan. You want your Korean won to be more competitive than that Japanese yen. That will make your product more competitive. That will allow your product to capture that share of the limited demand. There's only so much demand, you want to get your share if you're a producer. And so you get currency wars. Countries want to compete using their currency to get that little bit of demand that exists in the world relative to the supply production capability. So supply exceeds demand, this is a problem. Further, we also know that this is exacerbating inequality because a lot of these markets, mainly because of technology but otherwise, are resulting in winner-take-all eco economics. There's huge returns on capital, smaller returns to labor. And when there's smaller returns to labor, people get upset. They're left behind. Inequality becomes problematic. And when it gets problematic, people take to the streets. They want to have a revolt, a revolution. They protest. And so you get populism. And in that context, what you also see is political leaders rise and say, you know what? I understand your wages have not been going up. I understand your life has not improved. It's not your fault. It's his fault. Oh, who's him? Doesn't matter. Him, her, someone over there. And so we put up the barrier. We put up the protection. The protectionism comes up. Right? We start saying, well, let's put tariffs, let's have immigration constraints, whatever you want to call it. 
And you see this all over the world. By the way, this is not just, uh, oftentimes people accuse, oh, this is an American phenomenon. No, it's happening in Asia. It's happening in Europe. What do you think Brexit is? Happening, what do you think Italy's going through? What do you think Mexico's going through? What do you think is happening? It's happening all over the world. That's what gives me comfort that these are global tectonic mega trends under the surface. These four key transitions. So protectionism is on the rise. And globalization, people say forget about it. We're lucky if the world is globalizing. And in fact, it may even be in reverse. Now why is that? It's actually pretty simple. Think about what a, the economics profession sold the mass citizenry of the world. They sold them this theory. You know what? Friction, all these other trade barriers, it's not good for the economics. We want to grow the global pie. Let's minimize the dead weight loss. We'll make everything efficient, and the way we're going to do it efficient is make it free trade. Everything will be better that way. Except it didn't work out that way. Not for the workers of the world. They have not benefited from this. And as a result, the politician comes and says, you know what, forget about that global economic pie. We're going to focus on our slice. We don't care about the grow the pie. We're going to focus on just our slice. So globalization goes in reverse. We see this happening now, right now. And then, so does it surprise us in this context that we get trade war friction? Countries say, it's seen as a zero-sum game. I win means you lose. You lose means I win. No more we can both win. That's not the thinking process anymore. And so, obviously, the big rivalry in the world is the US-China rivalry from an economic perspective. And so I'm going to come back to that. I would love you to think about your questions. So at the end, we can take some time for some questions. But it's also more than that. It's now politics involving itself with central banks. And so there's a huge debate going on globally. Again, I put pictures here of my country. But globally, central banks are now turning into political tools. And leaders are trying to get central banks to do what they want, rather than what central banks that are independent would naturally do. And so we're going to come back to that also with some questions. I think there's a unique dynamic in the United States specifically that I think is, uh, is quite uh, disturbing, actually. Um, and yet, despite the, so that's a pretty depressing world, right? I mean, sort of, wow, that's not good, right? If the bar was open, you should have a drink, but there's no bar. We're at a school here. But despite that dynamic that I just described to you, and I'm sorry, you, it might be difficult to see it here, world markets are pretty rich. They're pretty fully priced. This is the CAPE ratio, cyclically adjusted PE ratio for the US equity market, the S&P 500. And what it shows here is that the markets on a PE basis, using normalized earnings, are higher than they were at the peak of the Great Depression. And they've only been higher once before, which was during the 2000 bubble. A little disturbing. And then you say, OK, well, we had a global financial crisis, and surely we've now gotten rid of those problems. That can't happen again, because we've deleveraged. We got rid of the debt. No. Actually, that hasn't happened. People that tell you that after the financial crisis, we delevered are not looking at the same data I am. Maybe there's a sector or a segment that has, has reduced its debt. Maybe households in some countries, possibly some corporates in other countries. But in aggregate? The world has a lot more debt today than it did before. And that's going to become increasingly problematic. And further, the world is back again in love with technology. And they're forgetting about the basic goods that form our societies. So what I did here was I took a, a couple, I took a ratio. This is a ratio of mining companies against the NASDAQ 100, which is a proxy, in my eyes, for technology companies. And what you see here is the ratio of that, those companies. Uh, and what you see is basically, beginning in 1990, it was a great time to be a technology investor. And you had great tailwinds, and everything did wonderfully. And then the internet bubble burst. And then it was a great time to invest in mining stocks. Or you could argue, val if you're a fund manager, I'm talking value, growth, same dynamic. So then you might as well move to value or real stocks, real economy stocks. And bam, that was a great time, right up until the financial crisis. And then you want to switch to technology stocks. And that would have been a great thing to be involved with right up until today. Now today, that ratio is the same as it was at the internet bubble. 
worth paying attention to? I think so. I think it's a caution flag, right? You've got to stop and say, wait, hold on a second. Worth watching. All right. So that's the world we're in today. This is a hockey player. I, I realize hockey may not be so popular in the Philippines, but that's part of the reason why I brought it here. Um, <laughs> this hockey player, uh, Wayne Gretzky, had a quote that he used. And the quote was, to be successful, you need to learn to skate to where the puck is going, not to where the puck is. And so everything I just described to you about the world, headlines, deflation, China, technology, inequality, populism, trade war, that's all the current stage of the world. That's where the puck is. But you shouldn't care. Actually, none of us really should care. Where we are matters less than where we're going. So let's start thinking about where we're going. And that's where I want to now shift. I want to spend some time thinking about how to navigate this uncertainty. How do you invest through these booms and bust dynamics? You got this up, you got this down, you got this left, you got this right. What do you do? And it's my premise to you that every single approach we take, every lens we use is biased, incomplete, and therefore not very helpful. What you have to do is use multiple lenses because they're going to unveil some of your assumptions and help you see the world differently. So that's what I want to do now. So we have to change our time horizon further. We also need to look out. Long-term thinking allows different thinking, especially in a world where everyone is short-term. So here's a map. It's a map of the world. Many of you have seen this map. There's nothing particularly unusual about this map, except this map makes one key assumption. It makes an assumption that the variable we all care about is land area. Now, that may be interesting if you're in the farming profession or something like that, but that's, you could argue, only one of very many variables we should think about when we think about the world. Here's another view of the world. This is the world as seen through the eyes of an economist. This map, each country on this map, is as large as its percentage of global GDP. So the land area on this map, the United States is roughly 20-something percent of global GDP. It's roughly 20 percent of the land area of this map. And so what you see is a distorted world, right? It's a distortion compared to what we think. What you see is the U.S. is obese. Well, actually, we know that, but that's a separate problem. <laughs> this is just uh, the map. <laughs> uh, Europe is a little bit larger than life, and so is Japan. But again, that's just another way to view the world. There's other ways, too. We look at how much land there is. We look at how much economic activity. What about how about number of people? That's probably pretty important, too. Here's a different way to view the world. And when you see this, something that everyone in the Philippines and most people in Asia recognize, Asia's large. We know a lot. Asia has a large number of people, right? But it probably suggests that, actually, when you start thinking about the future, the, Asi the future is Asian, right? Further, the other thing we can do with relative certainties, we can guesstimate where population growth is going to be. We have birth rates, we have uh, mortality rates, we have fertility rates. We can sort of put this into models and guesstimate. And so the world is supposed to grow in population dramatically. Where? Where is this population growth? Not in the large economies, by the way. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Water bottle. Sorry. <coughs> so when we look to see where the population growth is, what we see is it's happening in a very concentrated portions of the world. Virtually all the population growth on the planet in the next 35 to 40 years is taking place in South Asia and Africa. Now, that could be a, both a good thing or a bad thing, depending upon how you think about it. I'm going to suggest to you it's a really good thing. And here's why. That portion of the world that I've circled up here, those happen to be the world's fastest growing economies by far. And the reason they're fast-growing economies is they're leapfrogging. They don't need, technology is not disruptive there, it's empowering there. Imagine you're a farmer in Kenya who's never had access to a bank, no technology, no pricing information. You have your agricultural output and you sell it to the distributor who comes to collect it from you. What price do you get? Whatever he offers you. You don't have a choice, right? And then he sells it. And what do you do? You get whatever you bartered for, because you don't have a bank account. Well, now, 
with a simple cell phone, M-Pesa is a service that allows them to get full transparency on market pricing, so they know what the price is in Nairobi, and they'll give a little discount to the guy to take it to Nairobi. But they're not going to give the guy a 90% discount. Suddenly, they can also store their value on the phone with electronic money. They don't need a bank. So suddenly, you're getting financial inclusion. You're getting to, so technology is helping. It's empowering. It's bringing more people into society, into the formalized society. And so these, this portion of the world where the population is growing is actually not surprising. It's the fastest growing econ economic areas as well. And that, I suggest to you, is going to result in a consumer boom. This is a large middle class that will likely spend money on goods and services. And as they do, what we're talking about in the language of what I was suggesting earlier, I'm talking about an aggregate demand shock. This is exactly the medicine you would order for the sickness I described in part one. A demand shock to suck up all that extra capacity, put the world back on track. And I see it coming, right? Now, why do I see it coming and what does it mean? Let's turn now to that. What do people do when they get more money in their pocket? Well, one of the things they do is they put more meat in their mouth. We know that with great evidence that people like meat. It's an aspirational product. It's a consumption thing, right? And you might say, okay, Vikram, how large is the animal protein or meat segment? How, that's not a big economic sector. It's small, right? And I'm going to say, no, it's actually not small. Because you have to think about the whole ripple effect that comes from consuming more meat. Because, of course, you are what you eat eats. So if you ate some chicken, the chicken had to eat too, right? And the chicken, each pound of chicken you consume, the chicken consumed two pounds of grain. Eat any pork? Okay. Well, when it comes to pork, the pig had to eat too. And the pig consumed four, three to four pounds of grain for each and every pound of pork you consume. Now, if you like beef, eight is the ratio. Eight pounds of grain go into that cow to produce one pound of beef. So already you can see the, the, the reason why I think this is a big and important development. A little more meat, a lot more grains. In fact, here, I'll even make it more uh, understandable in a visceral sense. Imagine you have a family of four sitting around a table. They have four bowls of rice in front of them. One bowl of rice in front of everyone. Now, they have some extra money. They say, let's put some chicken on top of the rice. Imagine the equivalent. What I'm suggesting is now there are three bowls of rice in front of everyone. Because two for the chicken is on top of the one of rice. So you've gone from four to 12 bowls on the table. Now imagine you go to pork, 20 bowls of rice on the table. Then you go to beef, 36 bowls of rice on the table. This is an exponential ripple. It's not just a linear ripple. This is an exponential impact. And it has big ramifications. By the way, Sometimes people criticize me. They say, well, hold on a second. People don't, that's just a couple. What about fish? Well, it turns out fish is more efficient. Right? Two times. Salmon is rough under two times. But if you really want to get efficient, I'm sorry to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to give this to you while you have just eaten. Um, it's delicious, yes. Yes, it can be delicious for some people. Yes, some people like it. Uh, insects are the most... Efficient converters of carbohydrates to protein. Um, and so, uh, in fact, I just came from Bangkok. There's a, uh, there's a restaurant there called Insects in the Backyard. Um, and the whole menu, beetles, caterpillar, crickets, you name it. And it's a high-end restaurant. So I'm just saying this is something to think about. Um, but of course, when I say you are what you eat, eats, you have to keep pushing it. What do the grains need to eat? What do plants need? Plants need fertilizers. Plants need water. There's a whole bottleneck system on water we can talk about in the world. There's a sort of any sunlight, soil. But when it comes to the fertilizer ingredients, there's one that I want to highlight. There's three main ingredients for fertilizer, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. There's plenty of nitrogen in the world. There's a reasonable amount of potassium in the world. Uh, that's known as potash for rocks, uh, mine and potash form. But phosphorus. Water-soluble phosphorus, you mine it in a phosphate rock. 75% of the proven phosphate rock reserves on this planet are in Morocco. That means Morocco is going to be more powerful in the land of fertilizer and definitely, therefore, food 
than Saudi Arabia or OPEC ever was in the land of energy. Whoa, that's a big deal. It's worth thinking about. All right, so we're going to get Western diets. And the rest of the world will start eating like the Americans. By the way, if you're very careful, you notice it comes with medication, right? So you see the medication <laughs> in the picture? Is if you eat like that, you probably need medication. But that's just the family of four I was talking about. I talked to you about four going to 36 with the existing population. Now, what happens when the population grows? Now we have a table of four going four to 36, but now we have more tables doing the same thing simultaneously. That's why I think we have an exponential on top of exponential trend, which is what gives me comfort that we have a demand shock coming. And that's why I think the consumer boom is likely. Let me show you again how it could be important. Well, first of all, actually, before we do that, let's talk about it. Uh, I was talking to you about there being too much supply, not enough demand. I'm telling you a demand shock is coming in protein I showed you. It's also being combated with, there's a supply shock also in a negative way. Supply is being reduced in China with this whole African swine fever. So you're getting less supply, more demand. This is going to solve the problem of too much supply, not enough demand. It's self-correcting, which is why it gives me comfort that we're going forward in a positive way. What else do people do? They travel, right? People like to move more. You move from a bicycle to a moped to a motorcycle to an air-conditioned car. And when you do, you don't want to go back, generally. I don't know. Some of you might, but I can't imagine. Maybe the traffic makes you go backwards. But that also results in environmental concerns rising, right? So more cars, more pollution, more pollution, more people that get upset about the environment. They want more attention focused on it. And you start getting mandates for more alternative energy. And alternative energy means you've got to have power, power storage facilities and batteries to keep it. That enables electrical vehicle mandates to come out, right? So electric vehicle mandates are now spreading around the world. And they're demanding to say, hey, you know what? No more internal combustion engines as of 2030, as of 2030, as of 20, whenever it is. And so this is pretty interesting because that's going to create a whole new demand ripple and a whole new supply chain. And that may emerge to have bottlenecks also. So think about what happens with lithium or other battery ingredients. Or here, here in the Philippines, there's cobalt, right? Or nickel or something like that. We could develop those. Those may be in really scarce supply relative to demand going forward. Might be an opportunity for investment. All right, what else do people do when they get more money in their pocket? Healthcare. People spend more money on healthcare. You go from emergency medical care for a sick child only towards more preventive care, you get the vaccines, and you keep going up the value chain. So it's eventually you have to, oh, I would like my teeth to look nice, I want sort of, you know, you have lifestyle then issues that come up, diabetes, other things. All right, so I know there's some, uh, some folks here uh, that are more entrepreneurial minded, business school students, some CFAs that are more entrepreneurial minded. I have an opportunity, and I think it's a good one, but I don't know, because I'm an academic, and I want to hear your reaction to this. So I think we have this trend where more money in your pocket means more meat in your mouth. Pretty good data. I can convince you of this. I know we also have a trend with more money in your pocket, more money on medicine. We've got a good, good trend there, too. Good data. We have reasonably good evidence, highly suggested, but reasonably good evidence, that Western diets produce Western diseases. Right? So we know so what that means is more meat equals more medicine. So given that dynamic, why couldn't we have a joint venture between a protein producer, someone who's in the beef industry, and a pharmaceutical producer? You go down your buffet line, you pick up your piece of beef, at the end of the row, you have a bowl of the cholesterol medication, you take your cholesterol medication. It's the same dynamic, right? You should co-market the beef with the cholesterol medication or your diabetes medication. OK, I see you're all giggling and you're sort of smiling because you understand that I'm saying it as a joke, but not really. And here's why. This is an exponential trend on top of an exponential trend. And when you get those exponential on top of exponential, you get a demand shock. 
Because I told you that there's an exponential trend with protein rippling through the whole economic sector of agriculture, then that trend is actually going to get on top of the already exponential trend on medicine, creating more need for medicine. And so you're going to get demand on top of demand on top of demand. And that gives me comfort that this demand shock is coming. Now, unfortunately, much as I wish I had a crystal ball, I don't. So what I want to do now is give you the roadmap, the signs you should watch for after I leave, next week when you go back to your office, or next month or next year when you're sitting there and you read the newspaper and you see some headlines. I want to give you the framework for you to take the headlines you see then and decide, was Vikram correct? Is that thesis happening sooner, slower, or not at all? I want to just tell you, because I don't know, this is my analysis right now, but the future is not particularly certain, right? I mean, you have to understand there's different dynamics at work here. So what I'm going to do now is then tell you the things I'm going to be watching for myself to adjust my thesis over time. So first one is, of course, China. We started off with the root conditions, so let's go back to those root conditions and see when and how will they change. Well, it turns out China has this new Silk Road program that you've probably heard of, known as the Belt and Road Initiative. It's been mixed results so far. They've been accused of lending money that countries can't repay, building infrastructures that countries and economic models don't support, and therefore they're just basically being colonialists of a different form. And so there's been a backlash. But I think the strategy is actually pretty sound, that they're going to use their extra capacity to develop future markets for Chinese goods and services. And they're going to do that by building the Silk Road right through Central Asia, Beijing, through the Middle East, down into Africa, and up to Europe. And all through Southeast Asia as well. That's announced projects for this particular program exceed trillions of dollars. If they start building these rails, ports, other infrastructures that they're going to plan to build, that has the potential to really cause another commodity boom. If that happens, my thesis, let's just say my thesis right now is that this consumer boom will really take full effect within five to seven years from now. If this happens faster and you're seeing headlines that the Belt and Road Initiative is taking off, there's good progress. Well, then maybe it's time to say, oh, hold on, Vikram's thesis is maybe three to five years now. Maybe it's sooner because we're using all the extra capacity in China and demand is coming. One adjustment. The other adjustment you can make is say, uh-oh, China has a lot of bad debt and the bad debt is getting worse. What do we do about that? That's a thesis. If that's what you find the headlines focused on, then you have to say, okay, slow down. We need to actually take a step back. Maybe it's going to go slower. Maybe the consumption will be crimped because they've got to deal with some bad debt issues. Maybe it's a seven to nine year thesis of Vikram's. Just adjust based on the data you see. What about technology? Well, it turns out technology is spreading rapidly into sectors we hadn't thought about. These two fish that you see on this picture here, the two fish are the same age. The one behind has been genetically modified. What do you think that's going to do to supply? If you can start, you know, you change these ratios, that's going to reduce the demand shock. It's going to be a different story if that happens. Maybe the supply wins. Maybe technology races forward and we have more supply. And this thesis keeps getting pushed out and out and out and it never happens. I don't think that's true, but it's possible. You can watch it. Now, alternatively, the other thing that happens with technology is technology could also create more demand. Right? So what if this whole, are you all familiar with geoengineering? Do people understand what that is? Is that a concept that people talk about here in the Philippines? No? Okay, so geoengineering is effectively Silicon Valley saying, what's the problem with climate change? We'll address it. We can fix it. We fix everything. We can use technology and innovation and entrepreneurship to fix it. Right? You got too many carbon particles in the air? Okay. We'll find something that binds to it and push it into outer space. Okay, you're getting too many uh, large storms and typhoons and other things are happening and it's causing disruption. Okay, no problem. Let's just jump up and get a set of satellites and we'll target them as appropriate and we'll disperse them before they actually become disruptive. 
We can engineer this problem of climate change. It's a huge potential. I don't know how likely, but not anywhere near, but it's worth watching because technology could do things like that, enabling for, this may be a huge demand driver by itself if it's that big. You know, President Trump uh, recently was accused of saying, I don't know if it's true whether he said it or not, that he would take a nuclear bomb and put it in, in, in the middle of a hurricane uh, that was coming off the coast of Africa before it got to America, because he wants to reduce the damage. Okay, we can laugh about it, ha, 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 he's using nuclear bombs in bad ways, agreed, but the concept of geoengineering is what he's getting at. And there's books, this, this is a book, uh, The Planet Remade, written by an Economist magazine editor. Uh, this is coming. It's worth watching. All right, what about what's happening in alternative energy? I talked about energy. This is a picture of the Ivanpah solar field. It's in Nevada. What it is, it doesn't have, there's no, not even one solar cell involved here. Not one. What they have are computer-controlled mirrors that turn with the sun to bounce the sun rays off, send it to that central glass tower, which has water in it, turns the water into steam, the steam turns the turbine, there's three of these towers in the desert, each one is powering 60,000 homes worth of electricity. Not one solar cell is involved here, right? So we're innovating in different ways. More supply of energy is coming. That could be bad. That's a race. Remember, it's a race between supply and demand. That's what the basic race is. This is more supply. Now, if you're careful, you've read the slide and you notice it doesn't say alternative energy. This has to do with the fact that um, I share these slides with some of my students. And uh, one of my students, when I was describing this development to him, he raised his hand very, very politely. And he says, they call me Dr. V. He says, Dr. V, slides mislabeled. I said, excuse me? It's not alternative energy. That's what I'm describing, alternative energy. He said, it's not alternative energy. I said, what? It's alternative energy. I just described it to you. It's power, it's solar, this and that. He says, you haven't been reading the environmental studies, have you? <laughs> and I said, no, oh wise one. Please inform me. And of course, he did. He says, well, actually, the environmental studies reports say that the birds that go near that glass tower, their feathers are lighting on fire. He said, this is actually a fried chicken slide. <laughs> I thanked him, and I said, that's great. I appreciate the input. I tell you what, every time I use a slide, I'll make sure I share your story. So this is, might be a hidden protein supplies. <laughs> Regardless, it's more supply. I'm not sure of what. OK. But on the flip side, when it comes to energy, the demand story is not going away. People love having air conditioning. People love driving. People don't want to stop. And for better or worse, the infrastructure for the internal combustion engine driven cars, still the most robust infrastructure there is. And so demand is still going forward. So when you think about energy, supply and demand, again. The last category, of course, I talked about was demographics and what was happening there. And here, this is something I want to talk about. This is something that's a real pet peeve of mine. Uh, I don't know if there's any media or, uh, or press in the room, uh, but I, I often am very discouraged by how they handle economic growth and thinking about middle classes. Oftentimes, reporters say, oh, GDP of the country is growing. It's great news. Actually, we don't care about GDP. What we care about is GDP per capita. I want to know about the money going into their pocket. And if there's more pockets, then it's less in each pocket. <clears throat> so what we want to pay attention to is GDP per capita. And that means it's a division problem, a very simple one. But you have to factor in demographics. And to not do so is to miss a key insight, which is it's money in each person's pocket that matters. And so I'll be on stage here with questions. I'll be with you for about an hour, right? Roughly one hour, I think I'm going to be with you. During that hour, Nigeria's population is going to grow by 540 people. By the way, I'm going to be with you for an hour, and then you're going to go, and during that next hour, another 540 people are going to come. And during that next hour, another 540 people are going to come. And during that next hour, another 540 people. And then you may reach your destination if the traffic's OK. <laughs> How about India? 
1,800 people per hour in India. Now, they can have economic growth. It's great. But they got to create a lot of jobs, too. Because India right now is adding one million people to its labor pool every month. Every month. So you got to create a lot of jobs. One million people per month. By the way, so I've done some work with the Indian. Uh, actually, I talked to the CFA Society in India, among other things. While I was there, I met with some senior Indian uh, government officials and regulators, and they're aware of these problems. I mean, this is not new to them. Um, and so Prime Minister Modi says he has a plan to address this issue. And his plan is to make in India, as the campaign he started. They're going to bring global manufacturing to India to export for world markets. It's exactly the Chinese development plan. Except I'm very skeptical. And here's why. India is not at the stage of development that China is. India is doing it 40 years or 50 years later than China did this strategy. And in India, the unskilled, illiterate Indian farm worker now has to compete with robots. The unskilled, illiterate farm worker in China never had to. And so China, you took the farmer to the factory, you got productivity and the middle class. In India, you get the factories, but the farmers aren't needed to be employed there. And so this is a really big and controversial topic, one that I believe India may never develop a large middle class. China may have been the last country to escape that sort of uh, low income status by developing a middle class through industrialization. So what India needs to focus on instead, which as does Africa, is education. You need to get education affordable, distributed, and you've got to upskill your people. Because that's their only hope. Anyway, the reason I bring that up while I'm here in the Philippines is, you know, given that fund flows affect the Philippine market dramatically, as a member of the emerging markets, I think India's got some real issues. And that could, in fact, come home to roost and ripple in the form of fun, fewer fund flows here. All right, so what do you do with this? Well, don't put your head in the sand like the ostrich. That's the message. I think what you can do is do what we're doing here. Use multiple lenses, connect the dots, triangulate some insights, and then say, hey, here's what this scenario says. This is what it'll mean. By the way, if we had more time, and what I do in my corporate consulting and advisory work is we do multiple scenarios. I only have time today to give you this one. Right, which is the demand shock scenario. We can do another one, supply boom scenario. Right? There's all different scenarios we can come up with. But I'm giving you one to illustrate the process. So let me give you an example of using multiple dots. One of the things I've done in my study of financial booms and busts is I've learned that skyscrapers are actually a wonderful sign to tell you when a bubble's about to burst. You say, huh, skyscrapers? Yes, skyscrapers. And it works a charm. Look at this. These are buildings going back even to 1907, but let's start with the Singer building. But we'll go to, in 1929, three towers competed for the world's tallest tower. The Sears Tower, uh, 40, sorry, 40, 40 Wall Street, the Chrysler Building, and then the Empire State Building. And then we had the Great Depression. In 73 and 74, we had the World Trade Center and the Sears Tower, and then we had a decade of stagflation because of the oil price shocks. In 1997, the world's tallest tower came to this part of the world, in Malaysia, with the Petronas Towers. By the way, that was completed, and occupants moved in just as the world was starting to feel the Asian financial crisis. Ground zero before the Asian financial crisis. In 1999, Taipei 101 was starting to get built home of the hardware side of the tech boom. And you had the internet bubble burst. And then in July 2007, within weeks of global equity markets peaking, the Burj Dubai, since been relabeled the Burj Khalifa, took the title of the world's tallest freestanding structure. And then we had the global financial crisis. So this works. This works as an indicator. I wish it didn't. 
But that's history, right? So this is a history lesson. More importantly is, what does it say about the future? Well, it turns out, you can see where the world's tallest towers are. If you read all the newspapers, you do global news searches. This is what I do, the analysis I do, and you can see where they're going to be. And so usually announcements even tell you, even if they are failed projects. So before we go there, after 2007, after the Burj Dubai took the title, the next country that said they wanted the title was China. Not surprising, right? So the Burj Dubai took six years, seven billion dollars of money to construct, and they built it, and it was finally completed. China announced in 2012 that they were going to build Sky City. They said they would do it at a cost of under one billion dollars. That's pretty impressive. And then they said they would do it in under 90 days. And you know what I said? I said, let's get one good typhoon before I go in it. I'm not going to go in it. I appreciate it that you built it quickly, but I'm just not trusting it. Let's make sure it's OK first before I go in it. You know, I'm going to make sure. Anyway, today they've stopped construction of it. And it, the foundation of Sky City, you see here in the picture, is being used as a fish farm. A tale of hubris and overconfidence gone wrong. Well, where are the world's tallest towers going to be? Last year. You could look it up, and this is where the world's tallest towers were going to be. You can see the Burj Dubai or Burj Khalifa right in the middle there. You don't need to. To the left of the Burj Khalifa is a, is a tower being built in Suzhou, China. The Chinese wanted the title. They're going to get it, they say. Well, not so easy. Saudi Arabia decided to no, it's the Jeddah Tower. One kilometer high going straight up. One kilometer in the sky. Of course, as these plans came together, the residents of Dubai said, no way. That's our title. You can't take it from us. And they announced the Dubai Creek Tower. 1.3 kilometers high. Straight. That was last year. This is this year, this is the problem. They've removed the Jeddah Tower. They've stopped construction. Uh-oh. A change in confidence level, a change of some issues there. Maybe it's worth watching. So why does this indicator work? This indicator works for three reasons. One, all of these towers are built by developers hoping to attract tenants. So they're speculative by nature, number one. Number two, they also are built using borrowed money. They're easy money conditions. Banks have to be confident. It's not 100% equity. It's usually involving borrowed money. And then lastly, there's a lot of hubris and overconfidence. You heard about the chest. I mean, I want to be the title, this and that. And by the way, think about this. In the Middle East, this is a desert. What are you going to look at from the 100th tower floor? I mean, it's sand followed by water. If you're going to build a tall, tall tower, do it someplace where you can see mountains or something. This is literally castles in the sand. Anyway, these are the reasons why. By the way, these three reasons also apply to the art markets. And so when world record art prices are being set, that also tells us of concern. How about a painting being sold for $450 million? Mohammed bin Salman is the supposed buyer of this uh, Da Vinci that came to market in 2018. Okay, well, that shows maybe a little overconfidence in Saudi Arabia. They had a skyscraper also. Uh-oh, a couple things are lining up. All right, world's most expensive boat. Mohammed bin Salman also needed a place to go when he wasn't in the desert. $550 million for a boat. But of course, he also likes to go to, uh, to Paris, and so he needs a place to stay when he's there. Bought a little place outside of Paris there just so he could have a summer cottage. Now, you can argue about that. None of these are problematic by themselves. Again, none of these, all of these are individual. But if you connect these dots, you triangulate your insights, and then you add on one little tidbit here. How about the fact that Saudi Arabian defense spending is surging at the same time? Whoa. Does this have to do with the fact that the geopolitics of the energy markets are shifting? Does this have to do with alternative energy, fracking, and other dynamics that are keeping prices low? Does this have to do with instability forthcoming in the Middle East? Is there overconfidence, and now they're t starting to get real military space? And by the way, we've got some tensions building with Iran. Oh, by the way, we're capturing tankers. Oh, by the way, we're blowing up tankers also. This is really concerning. right? So this is something I'm showing you is a way to utilize the framework of connecting dots spotting uncertainty, 
before it really spikes. So what does this mean for things that most of us investor types like to think about? What does it mean if you're managing money? What does it mean if you're a CFA type trying to wander, wander your way through these boom and bust dynamics? Here's what it means. Actually, I'm going to ask a question, or since there are CFA types. Does anyone know who this picture is? Does anyone know? I don't think they put pictures on the CFA exam, but uh, not yet. I'll convince them yet. This is a picture of Hyman Minsky. Hyman Minsky was an economist. He wrote about credit cycles, this and that. And he had one key insight, which is broader than credit cycles, and I think is highly relevant today. His one key insight was stability itself generates instability. The longer you're stable, the more comfortable you are taking more risk. The longer you're stable, you take more risk. The longer you're stable, you take more risk. And that potentially leads to more instability when the catalyst comes, right? So that could be a real threat to your world if you don't think about it that way. It could be an opportunity if you're thinking about it. Because fundamentally, what I'm getting at is nonlinear change. Imagine it this way. How, what happens to an avalanche or a landslide? I mean, we can use lots of analogies. What causes it? People often say, we don't know. Because what it is is a series of little changes, none of which is independently important. And an aggregate causes a massive shift. So you get a little change, nothing happens. 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 People are used to it. Nothing's going to happen. A little change, the world changed. What happened? What happened? It was an accumulation of little changes. That's what causes avalanches. That's what causes its landslides. That's what causes all sorts of things unexpectedly. I think we're on the verge of that with financial markets. One catalyst could be money and the price thereof. Right? So now it may be going down, but when money goes up in price, sorry, this is the US rate. I apologize for being so American centric, but it tends to affect global flows a lot more than other currencies do. Uh, but fundamentally, what you see here, if you look closely at that federal funds rate, is that as the Fed raises rates, usually it plateaus, stops, and then it starts coming down. There's usually always a dark gray bar once that happens. A dark gray bar is usually a recession. I mean, it is a recession on these maps. So this is suggesting we may be heading towards a recession. Is it possible that you raise 25 basis points, nothing happens? Another 25 basis points, nothing happens. Another 25 basis points, nothing happens. Another 25 basis points, the world just changed. Yes, that's a possibility. And in fact, I think that may be not just a possibility, but a probability here. All right, what about climate change? Same thing? Small changes, nothing happens. Small changes, nothing happens. Small change, nothing happens. Big, small change, huge changes happen. Is that possible too? Yeah, I think so. I was just in Australia. I saw the drought, uh, half the farmland being uh, suffering drought conditions. Thailand, same thing. I mean, places are drowning or, you know, or dry. Conditions are spreading like that. The United States, is, the farmland was drought, uh, had droughts many years ago. Today, flooded. Too much moisture. Actually, let me share this one story with you. So I'm invited often to give talks. Uh, sometimes I get invitations from elementary schools, which I love to do. I have uh, two young kids, and so uh, one elementary school in Boston invited me to come talk to the children about climate change. I said, great, how old? They said, roughly seven years old. I said, great, I'm going to prepare my talk, make sure to get some pictures, the nice pictures. We'll just, not really a talk, I'll just have a conversation with them. So I get prepared, I go. I'm about to start and there's you know, probably 10, 12, maybe 15 kids, about seven, eight years old. I haven't said a word. Hands are up. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm. My hands raise their hands. And so right away, I get there, and they raise their hands. Right away, asking questions. And I said, yes, what's, I haven't said anything. <laughs> what's your question? And the little boy says to me, my father is saving the climate. He's stopping climate change. He's helping the environment. I said, oh, really? Of course, I'm in Boston. I think maybe his father's a professor at MIT. Maybe he's got a startup he's captured. Maybe he's doing geoengineering. Maybe he's doing something, right? Sort of really interesting. I said, OK, well, what does your father do? He says, my dad drives a Tesla. <laughs> I laughed also. And I said, oh, is that so? I'm sorry, I don't understand. How is that saving the environment? 
And he says, oh, you don't know. Let me tell you. And so he says, actually, we don't put the dead dinosaurs in our car the way you do in your car. We don't have the dirty fumes coming out the back that make the air so toxic. We are clean. I was like, oh, that's wonderful. How is it that you get the car filled up? He says, oh, it's electric. It gets electricity. That's how it runs. And I said, thank you for that. That's very helpful. By the way, where does the electricity come from? And he says, the wall. <laughs> he says, the wall. Right? And now it's funny when it's a seven-year-old. It's not funny when it's your political leader. <laughs> right? So that's the other problem we have. When political leaders think this way, that's another problem. I didn't have the heart. I really didn't have the heart to tell the poor child. I said, listen, the fact is, it's coming from a hydrocarbon fired power plant, right? And so the reason I bring this up is climate change is going to be a focus. And I believe there's going to be both threats, but there should be opportunities to really make meaningful change, right? And so you can laugh about the Tesla using it as a marketing example, but it could also be substantive real change. And so there's going to be investment opportunities there, for sure. All right, how about redistribution? Inequality is the Achilles heel of capitalism. For sure. Inequality is the Achilles heel. Turns out what happens, what's happening, not what's happened, what's happening right now in the world is exactly what the communist playbook suggests will happen. Capitalism self-destructs. Workers of the world get squeezed. Inequality rises. Right? Return on capital goes up. Return on labor goes down. That's what's been happening. And eventually, what's the call, they say? Workers of the world unite. Overthrow those who put you in this condition. That's the world we're in. That's happening. And so, is it surprising then that we have policies around the world where there's more redistribution? This is a picture of Tammy Baldwin, an unknown political leader in the United States, generally outside of the United States. She's been in elected office for roughly 20 years, during which time she's voted to raise taxes 430 times. This is redistribution, it's coming. More redistribution is coming. This is not just a US phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. Take from those who have, give to those who need. Marx and Engels actually said, from each according to their ability, to each according to their needs. This is a real possibility. And so I think it's something particularly investors need to think about because I think it comes down to changing the mindset to be more of a stakeholder mindset than a shareholder only mindset. Workers matter. And so paying as little as possible may not be the solution to long term uh, success in a capitalist. Capitalism needs to be more accommodating of those left behind. And I think that's what this is saying. And so you see in the United States, some, country, some companies are now saying, you know, we know the minimum wage is $15 an hour. We're going to pay $20. <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. Sorry about that. We know it's uh, $15. We're going to go to $20. Because that's what's going to make sense. And so you can view it as an opportunity to stay ahead or a threat if you don't pay attention. Artificial intelligence, definitely coming. We know that. Again, you can view it as an opportunity or a risk. Excuse me. This is a topic that needs a sip of water. Excuse me. It's a major topic. And I suspect we'll have some questions. OK. You know, I had breakfast this morning with a couple of uh, local business and uh, economic and financial leaders here in the Philippines. And one of the first questions asked of me was, Vikram, what do you think of the trade war? My answer was, it's not a trade war. It's not a trade war. It's much bigger, much broader, and much more serious and complicated than a simple economic issue. It's not just a trade war. It's a technology war. It's a space race. It's a currency war. It's a trade war. It's an ideology war. It's 
a military war? We hope not. This is great power rivalry, is what this is. There are many examples in history where you've had a great power up top and a rising power coming. And that it leads to conflict. In fact, rarely does it not lead to conflict. It leads to conflict. It's a question of how that conflict gets manifested. One likes to believe it can be done peacefully, and hopefully economic integration and other issues force that outcome. But that's actually a rarity in history. More often than not, it results in some form of, of physical conflict as well. The last big great rivalry handoff, a uh, great power handoff, if you will, uh, was done really with the Brits handing it to the Americans in a peaceful way. But they had a common enemy, right? They had a common uh, nuisance, if you will, in the Soviet Union. Um, I don't know how this is going to play out. That's what I will say. What I will, uh, from a financial, investing, and economic perspective, I will say that it seems almost preordained to me at this stage that corporate profits are going to have to slow. They're going to have to slow, right? Because there's frictions in the supply chains. When President Trump tweets that the U.S. companies need to get out of China, whether he meant it or not, whether he said it or not, whether he you know, retracts it or not, it's created an uncertainty in corporate boardrooms in America. I've advised many of them. Um, that forces them to rethink their supply chains. It's going to create friction. It's going to reduce capital expenditures and investment, which is going to slow growth in the future. Earnings margins will likely compress. And so that's a real negative, regardless of whether we get it you know, tomorrow. For all I know now, we've had a tweet that says, China and US have made peace, right? Markets will go way up. I don't think it takes the uncertainty away, because if you think about it the way I am, which is this is an onion with multiple layers, what you find is there's not an easy solution. What we need is a framework and process to manage it, hopefully, respectfully, peacefully, and to the benefit of all. That's what we need. That doesn't seem particularly likely right now, but I hope that's where we go. Happy to take more questions on this, because you can view this, uh, particularly here in the Philippines, this can be either an opportunity or a threat, depending upon how you want to think about it. And it may cause some more issues for the Philippines, maybe more opportunities, different ways to think about it. Fundamentally, what am I saying? I'm saying that everything can be seen as either an opportunity or a threat, and that is merely a way of thinking. It's your choice. You can choose to think from a threat perspective. And if you do, by the way, no one would blame you in your business. Because you'd be, long, you'd be focused on the local dynamics. You'd say, oh my goodness, we've got these issues here. Short-term issues. Oh my god, the trade war is making us vulnerable. Let's get defensive. Alternatively, you can be opportunistic. You can think big picture, broadly. See the world differently. Look for the growth. Find the opportunities. And I think that's the right way to go. Because I think if you have the ability to look through the noise, there is actually this demand shock coming. And that's a really positive outlook. There's risks along the way. But nonetheless, I think that's the right way to go. So those are my organized comments for today. Uh, the slides are prepared for you. Uh, a couple things in closing before I turn to questions. Number one, this is my contact information. Uh, I'm on Twitter. You can feel free to connect with me there. Uh, I prefer people connect and follow me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, on my LinkedIn profile, actually, uh, there are somewhere between 800 and 1,000 word, word articles on every single slide I've just put up here. So if you want more information, you want to learn more, you want to read more, go to my LinkedIn profile and look through the posts. There's 115, 120 articles that I've written there. They're all there. They're all publicly available and for free. So you can go there and you'll get them. I'd love your thoughts, reactions. Uh, if you like them, uh, I'd love to hear that you liked it or found it useful. Um, so those are my organized comments, and those are, that's where you can get more information. Uh, but otherwise, thank you for taking the time to listen to me. And I believe we have some time for questions. Yeah? Do you? Okay. <laughs> Happy to sit and take questions? Sure. Are you going to moderate the questions then? Yes. Perfect. All right. All right, that was a very interesting uh, talk uh, by Dr. Uh, Manchar Ramani. Um, yeah, so we're now open to questions from the, from the audience.
Um, there are microphones uh, situated in the, uh, the floor, please. Yes? Okay, so let me also say something. If people don't come up with questions, I do this for a living, I'll call on you. <laughs> okay? So I'll give you a, a three-minute grace period. We have one question. So during that three-minute grace period, you can think of your question, and then I expect to see someone come up to the mics. And if not, I'm happy to call on people. Yes, please. Uh, hi, doctor. I love the talk. Learned a lot of things. So I love how you talk about connecting the dots. However, as Steve Jobs said, it's actually a lot easier to connect the dots looking backwards, hindsight bias. Um, so two questions. One, how do you arrive to those four dots being one of the most pressing mm -hmm. selection of dots to connect? And moving forward, as you said, as you said times change. Yeah. What's the process or analysis you can teach or share with us to identify future dots that will influence? Yeah, yeah. No, look, so uh, there's no significance other than, uh, other than uh, these are the four biggest themes. China's a big theme, etc., and they resonate with audience. I would encourage you to use more. Right? Look, I could go down and talk about social dynamics, millennial mindsets, cultural dynamics. There's so many dots. More of the merrier. Right? My view is more lenses. Unfortunately, I don't have time to spend with you. I could spend a day and a half talking to you about many more dots to connect. Right? So take as many as you want. I think it's useful. The emphasis of what I'm suggesting with connect rather than generate is really a question of where the focus could be. There are plenty of experts that get very deep and narrow, right? And that's great. We need them. They're the ones generating the dots. What, what, what we need, though, is someone to pay attention to the context, the big picture. And so connecting the dots is one way to describe it. But really what I'm suggesting is answer the question of so what? So, oh, we had a fr shale fracking boom in America. North American energy supply. North America's energy independent. So what? Okay, when you ask that so what question, you say, okay, America is going to be less vulnerable. Okay, so what? Keep, pu keep pushing it. Why, why, why? And suddenly you say, hold on a second. This could be geopolitically destabilizing. Hold on a second. This could reduce demand for energy, which certain countries depend on. Hold on a second. That's what I mean by connecting dots, which is really take a step back and look broadly at implications. But it's really lenses that I'm talking about more than dots. Dots is just a more convenient way to describe it. So now going forward, I would encourage you to do the same thing. Use broad. It's, it's an emphasis on breadth over depth. That's what I'm saying. Scan. Be a generalist at times. Generalists are able to navigate uncertainty a little better, I think, than specialists. Because specialists are like hammers uh, looking for nails, if you will. Whereas a generalist has lots of tools and they figure out what's appropriate. So hopefully that's up. Okay. Next question. Yes. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Since I'm part of the baby mover generation, <laughs> what resonated with me was your thesis about uh, <coughs> more money, more meat, more disease. Happens in the last 30 days, I've been viewing a lot of YouTube videos about the interconnection between the so-called age-related diseases, like heart-related, including uh, macular degeneration of the eyes, is actually not age-related per se, but related to the diet that you've been taking in all these years. And the studies, like say, a first-generation Hawaiian family or Japanese, taking American diet. By the third generation, they have the same mm -hmm. obesity heart rates as the American population. That's right. The other element that's, again, I'm connecting it to other that, where the two fish, the big one and the small one, the big one is uh, genetically uh, modified. But precisely, part of the diseases generated by this uh, age-related, so-called uh, age-related uh, diseases, diet, is uh, to get to the point, they're blaming Monsanto because of this huge uh, volume of genetic, genetically modified corn and all those others which feed into all of these things. And these are the things that generate the biochemical reactions that generate cancer or that when you ingest it, it generates radicals that your body identifies as a foreign body and therefore it's your autoimmune system that 
fight your own body. So there's a spike. There's a correlation. Yep. So it's again a threat and an opportunity. Yep. So if that trend is going in the U.S. and in the Western world, we're expecting to see something like that in a uh, developing world like uh, the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So the, the question is, how do you, how do you, you recognize the threat, but the opportunity is, how do you benefit from <coughs> the supply shock of getting this more supply without the threat of this uh, downside of having genetically modified uh, food as we go forward? I think I understand the question. Uh, I think you're asking about how can we feed the world, right? How can we feed the world without the real downside of genetic modification because it has other health-related issues? Uh, look, I think shifting diets is actually part of the problem, right? So um, there's big movements globally. I don't think they're going to work, but you know we have in the United States right now a whole bunch of meat alternative companies, meat food tech companies, they call them. Uh, the most famous of which is a company called Beyond Meat. And so they're taking pea protein and they make it look like meat, they make it sizzle like meat, make it, but it's not meat. And if you do that, you're just changing diets in a different way. The environmental impact of a Beyond Meat burger is minuscule compared to a real beef burger, right? So you can shift diets, this is one thing. Second thing is just to educate people to understand the choices they're making. I think most people don't realize that a cow has eight times the grain. Right? It's an inefficient use of, you can have people eating the bugs. That's going to save the environment. Really? When you think about it, these are the things that sort of, it's actually more natural, right, in this way. So I think there's different things you can do to shift diets and, and, and improve uh, this. But, you know, fundamentally, the other thing I would say, it's really important and people, from an investment perspective, I think is a big opportunity. Uh, we waste a lot of food. We waste a lot of food. Food, so on this planet today, we produce roughly 3,000 calories per person per day. That's more than enough for everybody to eat. More than enough. The problem is, there's probably a billion people who go hungry, and there's a billion people who waste a lot. If we could move it around or not let waste happen, and then there's spoilage. So refrigerated distribution chains could be improved, particularly in Africa and some other emerging markets. That'll keep food from spoiling. That's a big investment opportunity, I think, given these trends. And then also, you could have less waste by having smaller portion sizes. You know, just we can eat less, all of us, probably. And, or, or take, there should be less stigma to go to the buffet six times. I take one piece. OK, I finished it. Let me have another one. OK, as opposed to take five pieces and eat three. So anyway, those are a couple answers. Should I call on one person? Can we call on one person? Yes, please. Oh, savior. The rest of the audience was anxious. <laughs> hey, Vikram, thanks a lot. It was a fantastic session. And uh, my question to you is, uh, you know, you're from US. Yep. You are in uh, Philippines right now. You talk about US-China uh, rivalry. We talk about the South China Sea. Yep. You know, the trillion dollar uh, crude oil over there. If it comes to Philippines, then definitely Philippines will become a developed country. I think so. Yep. And if it goes to China, then it will become you know, more than $20 trillion uh, economy. What's your take on that? On the South China Sea specifically? Yeah. So I'm not an expert in the South China Sea, uh, but what I do know is you get a situation where you have, what, six, seven nations claiming certain parts of it. Uh, it's a, I mean, it, it's a political mess. Uh, I think what's likely to happen is it will turn into be uh, a, it has to be politically negotiated. Uh, and I think military might will come into play. And so here's another way I could describe the situation to you as one possible scenario. I don't think this is likely or unlikely. I'm not putting any probability on it. But you can imagine a scenario where my president, President Trump, says, okay, you guys in the Philippines, we love you, we've been happy with you, good partners, allies, it's great. We need you to cut ties with China. You pick a side now. You know, he's like, like a, almost like a, uh, like a playground. This is how it works. You know, are you on my team or their team? Whose team are you on? You on our team? Okay, if you want to pick America, we're going to give you military protection. We're going to be there. We'll help defend your claims in the South China Sea. We're on your side. 
but stop trading with them. You're part of our ecosystem now. Alternatively, that makes the choice for the Philippines, again, I don't know if this is likely or unlikely. This is me just thinking out loud. Don't suggest this is like, I don't want anyone to report. <laughs> Dr. Manjamani said, uh, China's, no, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is this is a scenario you can think about. And if that was forced, I ask you, you all are here as, in the Philippines, which side do you pick? Do you pick the economic loyalty? Then you're not getting that $20 trillion. You pick that side, the, you know where the South China Sea loyal, that's going there. It's China. What are you going to do? By the way, you could do the same analysis. Yeah, I could do the same analysis to Australia. Right? You do the same analysis. Australia, great ally, loyal partner, political military connections with the United States for wonderful ally. Pick a side. And this world is increasingly becoming polarized to the point where what happened during the Cold War? You were on a side. You had to get on one side or the other. I mean, unless you Switzerland tried not to be, right? You could get that's probably a bigger issue. The South China Sea may be a, a flashpoint that gets answered by the answering of that bigger issue. So anyway, I hope that's helpful. Again, I don't have unique insight, just me thinking out loud with you. So any more questions from the from the audience? Actually, uh, Dr. V, I, ha oh. I have a question. Perfect. <laughs> right. So, um, right, human evolution, right? We're supposed to like develop into a better version of ourselves, right? But in this question of, you know, do we have to go through all these booms and busts all the time? I saw your charts yeah. earlier, and it becoming it's becoming more and more frequent, right? <clears throat> all these peaks and valleys, yep. and yep. you know, the frequency of it, yeah. right? Yeah. They're becoming more yeah. and more frequent. Um, yeah. Yeah. Isn't it that? You know, humans are supposed to yeah. evolve, and you know, how yeah. do you, uh, is it is it a situation where eventually this will all, you know, die down? And you know, is there a, is there hope that there won't be any booms and busts down the road? No, I think this is part of human nature. I really do. I think this is alternation between greed and fear. I think greed comes, gets to the point where people finally get scared, and then you get fear, and fear overshoots, you get the bust, and then people start saying, oh, maybe there's some value here, it stopped, oh, now there's greed, I can make a lot of money, go back and forth. Uh, I would argue that a lot of what's happened in the world, those cycles that you're talking about, that I write about in my book, um, really all started actually in a similar way to what we have with US-China rivalry, but it was with US-Japan rivalry. So uh, back in 1985, uh, very quick history lesson, sorry. I can't help myself. I do this for a living. Uh, back in 1985, we had the Plaza Accord. And that was because Japan was taking over the world, and they had an unfair currency advantage. And the developed world that traded with Japan said, stop. It's unfair trade practices. You need to appreciate the yen. And when they did, what happened? All of the money in Japan suddenly you know, they lowered rates, things went through the roof, you know, they had a bubble peak there. And then after that bubble burst, the J Japanese bubble burst, early 90s, all the money came here, Southeast Asia, right? And they set up all the infrastructure and factory in Thailand and everywhere. And, all. and then, I actually think the Chinese are to blame, personally. Uh, 1993, at the end of the year, December 31st, 93, you went to sleep, it was like five and change renminbi to the dollar. January 1st, 1994, it was eight renminbi to the dollar. They devalued by 50% overnight. As a result, the global manufacturing world went to China and they became the world's workshop, making all the mismatches in terms of currency in Southeast Asia more visible, causing the Asian financial crisis, which almost brought down long-term capital in Russia, which led the Fed to go down to zero, which got almost zero, which resulted in the uh, internet bubble, which led to the next burst, which led to the housing bubble, which led to this burst, led to the global financial crisis. This is, it's all related. The problem is our medicine is producing our next disease. That's fundamentally, I think our monetary medicine, our economic policy prescriptions are causing our next diseases. And so until we break that habit, I think you're still gonna get more and more of this up and down. Uh, but I also think greed and fear are real, uh, real human instinct and emotions. And I don't think we've evolved in that sense. But if you take away the, you know, the emotions out of it, greed and fear, like for example, you flashed the slide there, artificial intelligence, yep. right? So you let the machines think, would that help? Well, how do machines think? Machines are programmed algorithms. Algorithms are based on prior history. I mean, they're thinking about, you know, 
they, if you, I, I think most investment managers put on their brochures, past performance is no guarantee, right, of future results. It's the same thing. You're teaching it a process, but then it's mindlessly doing the process. So maybe it gets better because it's mindless, yeah. but it's still interacting and it's still designed by people with emotions and it's using historical data which has those all embedded. And if it doesn't use historical data, is it really getting smart anyway? Yeah. There you go. So anyway, it's unclear yet. It might make it less, but made it more. Anyway. All right. Any more questions? All right. Great. So thank you. I guess uh, with that, we thank uh, Dr. Vikram thank for spending this time with us. <laughs>